surrounded by rings. Rings on our fingers, tree rings, rings around the moon, and hula hoops that fall. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob McDonald. Did you know that planets can have rings too? In fact, planets with rings are the largest planets that we know of. So stick around and keep your heads up, because we're going to worlds that are lords of the rings. Some, uh, some have craters on them. We got some with moons. <laughs> I've asked our young artists here to draw me some alien planets. And uh, we come up with some very interesting designs here, guys. But I noticed, look, some of them have rings. Here's one with rings. Here's one with rings. This one does. This one's got two rings. That's kind of neat. Never thought of that. Here's another one back here. This one's got two rings around it. This one doesn't. Isn't it funny how some planets have rings and some don't? In our solar system, we have nine planets. Almost half of them have rings, but the Earth does not. Can you imagine what it would look like if the Earth had a ring? We'd see it arching across our night sky. It'd be a really spectacular sight. Why some planets have rings and some don't is still a mystery. And if we want to find out, we have to go there and look at those rings with our robots. This is something that I maintain as part of my job. I created this called the Tour Atlas. This is an overview of our entire, entire journey at Saturn. These are the sequence of... Kevin Grazier is flying around Saturn. Well, he's not going there himself, but he is part of a team that's controlling a robot that's already circling the ringed planet and that's as close to being there as you can get. The robot is called Cassini, and it's circling Saturn right now, taking pictures of the giant planet, its rings, and a large family of more than 30 unusual moons. Cassini took almost seven years just to get to Saturn, which is why there are no people on board. No one wants to spend that long living inside a spaceship trying to reach a planet. So scientists on Earth see the ringed planet through Cassini's eyes. And what they see is unlike anything we see on our planet. As a planet, Saturn is dramatically different than Earth. Earth uh, is a solid planet, like one of the terrestrial Earth-like planets. This is a Jovian or gas planet. Now, at the very center, there are roughly 10 to 15 Earth masses of solid material, but Saturn's 95 times the mass of Earth, so most of it is just gas. It's a big ball of hydrogen and helium. In fact, Saturn's the only planet in the solar system whose density is less than that of water. That means is that if you had Saturn have a bathtub big enough, Saturn would float. It would, of course, leave a ring. Oh, brother, a bathtub ring. They're everywhere. Or are they? We have nine planets in our solar system, but only four of them have rings. And they turn out to be the four biggest planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The five small planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Pluto, don't have rings. And this is a mystery that's puzzled astronomers for hundreds of years. Uh, let's see, we got Mercury, Venus, Earth, I really like that one, Mars, <laughs> Big Jupiter. But you know, of all the planets in the solar system, the most recognizable and what some people say is the most beautiful is the planet Saturn because it has this magnificent set of rings going around it. The first person to see these rings was a guy named Galileo. And he pointed a fairly small telescope at Saturn in the year 1610. And what he saw were what looked like handles sticking out either side of the planet. Well, what's even stranger is that a couple months later, Galileo pointed his telescope at Saturn again and the handles had disappeared. And Galileo said, my glass has deceived me. Well, actually, what really happened is that Saturn had changed its position so that the rings had tilted up and were edge on to Galileo. He was seeing them from the edge, and they're so thin that they seem to disappear in small telescopes. What could they possibly be made of? The rings are overwhelmingly water ice. Water ice in the outer solar system is really quite common. In fact, it's so cold in the outer solar system, we consider ice a rock. At the temperatures we find out here, ice is as hard as granite. 
So mostly water ice, but since there is some color, there's other material there, we're not quite sure what that is yet. We're working on that. How about that? The rings of Saturn are made of snowballs. Billions of ice particles floating around Saturn like a billion tiny moons. They're spread out around the planet in a thin sheet that's hundreds of thousands of kilometers across, but only a few meters thick. The rings of Saturn are the most organized snowstorm in the solar system. I mean, imagine this. Thousands, billions of snowballs all flying around Saturn, spread out in a perfectly flat sheet. Now, to give you an idea of just how big this snowstorm really is, on the scale of this photograph, our entire Earth would be about the size of my fist. Now, if we put the Earth down here at one edge of the rings of Saturn, all the way over on the other side of the planet and the other side of the rings would be our moon. That's how big the rings of Saturn are, the distance between the Earth and the moon. That's incredible. Up close, you can see right through them. And if you were floating among all those snowballs, it would be easy to stick your head above them and see right across the whole system. What a sight that would be. Now, you might be wondering why Saturn's rings go around its middle in a nice flat plane like this and not some other way, maybe around this way, north to south. Well, it has to do with the way things turn. Now, Saturn spins on its axis. So let's suppose that my head is the North Pole and my feet are the South Pole. Saturn turns around. In fact, the Earth turns around like that, too, except Saturn turns twice as fast as we do. Now, when Saturn formed, it formed out of a huge cloud of gas that was also rotating like this. Now, if you have stuff that's left over, as I'm rolling around, watch what happens when I let this ball go. The ball wants to get as far away as it possibly can. And as it does that, the string is pulling it back. Now, the string represents Saturn's gravity. So the string is pulling in, the ball is pulling out, and it basically wants to stay out there sort of around my middle. Now, watch what happens if I pull it back in, and I try to do this, <laughs> without getting dizzy, over my head. Okay, so I'm turning around at the same speed. If I hold the ball up here and let it go, it just falls straight down. It doesn't work at all because <laughs> it really wants to be as far away as possible out the middle. So when Saturn was forming, the stuff that was above and below fell into the planet and became part of the planet itself, and the stuff that was left over around the middle just kept going around and around and around, caught in this gravitational tug of war. Saturn has a large family of over 30 moons. Most of them do the same thing. They orbit the planet around its equator. Now, we see this kind of thing all the time, where a large group of individual objects all move together in a big circular sheet. Now, you can see this effect of particles going around a big object, spreading out into a flat sheet, and forming a ring. Watch the riders on this swing ride. No matter how big they are, they all go out the same distance. So the big question at Saturn is why is it surrounded by billions of tiny little ice balls rather than a few big moons? Well, the answer has to do with gravity. The reason planets have rings is because gravity gets weaker with distance. And we don't notice it in our everyday lives because we're so tiny compared to the planet in which we live. If I stand up, I am being pulled towards the center of the Earth, which is about 6,400 kilometers beneath me. Okay. Now, I'm about one and a half meters tall, which is negligible. So the force of gravity on my head is almost identical to the force of gravity on my feet. I don't feel that difference, which an astronomer or physicist would call tides. But if you could imagine that I was the size of the moon, and the moon were to come close enough to the Earth, the force of gravity on the near side of the moon, exerted by the Earth, would be considerably greater than the force on the far side. And that would mean that the near side was trying to fall in towards the Earth faster, being accelerated more than the far side. And eventually, that difference in force would be enough to actually overcome the strength of the solid rocks in the moon and would begin to stretch it out. And eventually, if it got close enough, be stretched out enough to rip it into pieces. And then those pieces would be ripped into pieces by this tidal force and so on. And then you would have, instead of a moon, you would have a whole cloud of debris 
of rubble, things that would look more like asteroids and meteoroids. And, of course, they wouldn't just hang together like that. They would gradually spread out in the lunar orbit and form a ring. Now, the Earth doesn't have a ring because the moon has been far enough away from it and, in fact, is moving slowly further away. So this will never happen in the history of the Earth-Moon system, as far as we know. Uh, and so that's why we don't have a ring. But had the moon spiraled in towards the Earth for some reason or formed much closer to the Earth than, than it is now, then it would be torn apart by our own planet's tides and we would have had a lovely ring system, in fact, probably a more spectacular one than Saturn. In the case of Saturn, we believe that a, a moon uh, you know, was in that danger zone where the force of tides was greater than the physical force that can hold the, the, the planet, the moon, together. And uh, it was literally either ripped apart, uh, a moon that already existed and was ripped apart, or material that would have liked to have come together to form a moon. But every time pieces tried to bond, they were pulled apart again by that tidal force. And they spread out and form these beautiful rings. Now, the rings are made up of countless billions of particles of rock and ice. And it doesn't look like that through a telescope or even through the Cassini spacecraft cameras from a distance. They look like these beautiful solid rings. That's just because there's so many of these particles. They're so close together that at a distance, they blend together. So if you were a moon, you can't be too close to a planet, or you'll be torn to pieces by the planet's gravity. But this idea of a moon being torn apart is just one suggestion for how Saturn got its rings. Another idea is that they're leftover junk that never became a moon. Or perhaps two moons collided, smashing each other to pieces. No one knows for sure because the rings that surround the four largest planets in our solar system are all different. Saturn's are bright and wide, while the one around Jupiter is barely visible and it's colored orange. The rings around Uranus and Neptune are thin and dark. Maybe there are different ways to get rings. In Jupiter's case, there's an orange moon called Io that has violent volcanoes shooting gas and dust into space. This is probably where Jupiter's ring comes from. The rings around Uranus and Neptune are arranged in long, thin lines with little moons running between them. Maybe the moons are acting like snowplows, clearing spaces between the rings. But the rings of Saturn are the largest and most spectacular of all rings. But getting a spacecraft there without hitting any of those snowballs was a tricky feat. Cassini actually went through a gap, and the outer part of the rings, when it arrived at Saturn, then flew right over the top of them. On the evening of encounter, we approached Saturn at a at a, at a maximum of roughly 70,000 miles an hour. We had to pass up through the ring plane, around Saturn, and back down through the ring plane. Now, when we passed through the ring plane, we passed through an area we knew was relatively devoid of ring particles, but that did not mean entirely devoid of ring particles. At the, at the speed we were traveling, a marble-sized object could have damaged or even destroyed the spacecraft. What we did was we rotated the spacecraft into a safer orientation. After passing through the ring plane safely, we turned the spacecraft around to fire our engines. 96.4 minute was, was the prescribed burn time. That slows the spacecraft down to allow it to be captured by the gravity of Saturn. After that, we were above the rings. This is the closest we ever get to the rings in the entire mission. So at that point, what we did is we turned the spacecraft to look down on the rings and got quite a bit of imagery, and really spectacular imagery, and then rotated the spacecraft to another safe orientation, dish into the particle direction again, so we passed down through the ring plane and onto our first orbit. So what's it like flying a robot to Saturn? That's extremely exciting. We have been in route for 6.7, almost seven years. And sometimes, sometimes our job is, is a grind like anyone else's, but when it becomes a grind, you sit back and you realize, I'm planning a mission to Saturn. You listen, you hear conversations about Enceladus, one moon over here, and, and Mimas and Tethys, and, and oh, what are we gonna do with this Titan pass? And, and you realize, I'm doing something that's really unique. It's really, uh, I would argue, one of the greatest endeavors in human history. We put a six ton in Earth's gravity spacecraft in orbit around Saturn, and we're gonna be there for four years and sending back more information than any spacecraft ever sent back. All the big gas planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have rings, but none of them are as weird as the planet Uranus and its ring. Uranus has a north and south pole like the other planets, 
and it turns on its axis like the rest, but for some unknown reason, the whole planet is lying on its side. It's as if the planet fell over and it's rolling around the sun like a bowling ball. It's the only planet that does this, and oddly enough, its moons and rings go around the same way, circling around the planet's equator. No one knows why Uranus does this. The rings of Uranus are very hard to see. In fact, they weren't even discovered until 1977. When a robot spacecraft named Voyager went to Uranus a decade later, it found the rings to be arranged in thin, thread-like lines instead of a big, broad sheet like Saturn's. Voyager also found that the particles in the rings are very dark. They look bright in these pictures because the camera is adjusted to make them stand out against the blackness of space. But if you could see them up close, they're actually as black as lumps of charcoal. The next planet out, Neptune, also has black rings arranged in thin lines like this. And Jupiter, the largest planet, has the smallest ring, and it's red. Four planets, four different kinds of rings, and one planet lying on its side. Now that's weird. Saturn is the planet that everyone associates with rings because they're so bright. Uh, you can see them through binoculars or a small telescope, and they're spectacular in images uh, taken from the Hubble Space Telescope or from space probes like Cassini. But the other three giant planets, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, also have rings. They're just a lot harder to see from a distance. One is that uh, the, the, uh, they may not have had a big moon close enough to be broken apart, or the material that would have built that kind of ring system. The other thing is just that they, they exist at different distances from the sun, and so the physical environment, what, how do particles of ice and rock behave is different. So the rings of, uh, uh, of, of Neptune, for example, exist at a much lower temperature, they reflect light in a different way. Rings of Jupiter are probably formed in a different way, though, than, than those of Saturn. They're probably material which has been basically released off of the inner moons like, like Io uh, into orbit, and they're made up of material which is actually kind of dark. They're a lot easier to see from behind when they're backlit. So they're almost invisible in the foreground. But as soon as the spacecraft goes past Jupiter, looks back towards the sun, you see Jupiter as a crescent uh, lit from the other side. And suddenly, the thin ring system comes out in uh, crystal clarity. And so it was really when the Voyager spacecraft went past Jupiter and looked back uh, that the rings became obvious. So the four biggest planets in our solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all have some kind of ring going around them. Well, what about the smaller planets, like Earth, for example? Well, it turns out that long, long ago, our planet did have a ring going around it for a while. When the Earth was very young, long before there was any life on it, scientists believed that a very large object, as big as the planet Mars, struck the Earth with a glancing blow. The force of the impact almost ripped the Earth apart. A huge piece of our planet was sheared off and thrown into space, along with what was left of the object that hit us. An enormous ring of dirt and debris surrounded the Earth for millions of years. Eventually, though, these ring particles began to clump together into a ball, which plowed through the rest of the debris, sweeping it up like a giant vacuum cleaner. Finally, that ball grew into what we now see as the moon. Hard to believe that the peaceful object that hangs so serenely in our night sky had such a violent beginning. Imagine floating among the rings of Saturn. You'd be surrounded in billions of little tiny ice particles all floating at the same speed as you are. Now, some of these particles are pretty big, maybe the size of a house, but some of them are only about the size of your fist, making them just perfect for a snowball fight. <laughs> now, if you just take a snowball and you throw it in one direction, whoa! You gotta be careful because the action to throw on the ball that way makes your body go this way. Of course, I guess I could always take another one and throw it in that direction to make it stop. <laughs> hey, snowball rocket fuel, what do you know? <laughs> of course, it makes it kind of tricky on how you're gonna aim the next one. While you're out here, 
there are some pretty amazing sights to see, by the way. If you look back towards the sun, the sunlight reflecting off all those ice crystals would make beautiful rainbow colors. And as you go around Saturn, you go around the backside of the planet, you'd see the sun setting in beautiful sideways sunsets. Stick your head up high and look above the rings. You can see across half a million kilometers of glistening snowballs all the way to the other side. Stick your head underneath the rings and you get a different view because of the way the sunlight comes through it. Boy, what an amazing place. This is very cool. One of the many mysteries of Saturn's rings is why they're not smooth. Up close, there are rings within rings, like the grooves on an old vinyl record. There are also two big gaps in the rings where the bigger particles don't seem to go at all. We saw waves in the rings like a wake of a passing ship as, as moons passed by certain parts of the rings. We saw places where the edge of a ring was being, was being gravitationally pulled by a moon, essentially flapping in the breeze. Now, not that rapidly, there is no breeze, but the gravity of the moon would pull up part of the ring and it would travel around as the moon passes around and we actually see these waves or these bending waves in the rings. We've also seen, image, or seen structures in the F-ring, the little skinny F-ring created by a moon called Prometheus, which actually enters part of the F-ring at time and creates these little, little gaps in the ring. Saturn is a really easy planet to spot. In fact, you can see it with your own eyes if you know where to look for it. It kind of looks like a star. It's just a little bit brighter, and it has a kind of yellow tint to it. But first, you have to find it. Now, it comes up every year, every season. You just need to know when. Maybe if you check in your newspaper, there might be a section that is the sky tonight. If not, there are web pages that do this, and they show you maps of the night sky and where to look and find the planets, including Saturn. Now, once you do find it and you go outside, and you want to look at it, if you have a telescope like this, or you know someone who has a telescope at least this big, you should be able to see the rings of Saturn with your own eyes. If you don't have a telescope or your friends don't, contact the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. They may have a branch in your city or town, and they very often have star parties where they bring their telescopes, and you can look through them and see the rings of Saturn that way. And if not, there's still one other way you can see Saturn. Go to another web page where you can see pictures taken by the spacecraft that's at Saturn right now called Cassini. And there are dozens of pictures like this one taken by the spacecraft that's actually there. And look at how beautiful this incredible planet is. It doesn't matter how you look at it, Saturn is truly a stunning world. Astronomers have discovered more than 150 planets orbiting other stars. They haven't actually seen the planets, but they can tell by the way a star moves through space that it has planets. They can even tell how big those planets are. And so far, all of them are about the size of Jupiter or even larger. Do some of those giant planets have rings as well? One new robot that may be able to answer that question is called MOST. It's a Canadian mission, and Dr. Jamie Matthews is the project leader. Most is designed to see really tiny changes in the brightnesses of stars or tiny changes in the things that are close to stars. And so we're the first instrument in history that would be sensitive to the reflected light from a planet as it goes around its star and literally goes through phases, just like the moon in our night sky or Venus going around the sun is seen through a telescope. If the planet happens to pass directly between us and the star, we would see what's called a transit, and uh, a transit of Venus just happened uh, in, in June of this year, a uh, very rare event, and we would see it too. What can we find out about it? Well, we actually hope to study the atmospheres of these planets, and then to some extent, even the weather, because what makes the planet reflect light are uh, materials that would make up clouds in its atmosphere, just like the Earth is quite reflective because it has these white puffy clouds. We have no idea, uh, based on observation, what the atmospheres of these planets are like. We have models and, and, and conjecture, but most would be one of the first opportunities to really test those ideas. And one of the big questions is, do these planets 
which are kind of like Jupiter, except so close to their parent star that they have atmospheric temperatures of 1,500 degrees Celsius, 2,000 degrees Celsius. So it's a kind of a weather system unlike anything that we've ever had to explore before. So does that mean there may be lots of other planets with rings out there going around other stars? Oh, I suspect rings are, are more common than we can imagine. These, these tidal forces, gravity works everywhere in the universe. It doesn't matter where we look, we see gravity working. Uh, and so rings must be there everywhere. And for future sort of interstellar tourist agencies, Saturn may prove to be you know, one of the great uh, travel destination points, but I suspect that there may be even more spectacular ring systems uh, around other planets, around other stars. But for the time being, let's support the, uh, the Solar System Tourist Bureau and invite all of the aliens to come here and appreciate the beauty and the hospitality of our solar system. Now, making a model of the rings of Saturn is a little tricky because the rings are actually floating in free space around Saturn. But here's a model you can build that's kind of close. You only need a few ingredients for this. One, a nice soft ball. Now, actually, the ball shouldn't be perfectly round. You should squeeze it a bit in the top and the bottom. Saturn spins so quickly that it actually bulges out on the sides and it's flat on the top and the bottom. It's not a round planet. So a sponge ball is a good model for Saturn. Then you need a bowl, preferably a glass bowl or a clear one with some water in it. And the bigger the bowl, the better. Then all you need is some pepper. So here's what you do. You put the water in the bowl and then just using your finger or a spoon, start stirring the water around and really stir it hard, like get it going so that it's really, really fast and it's swirling around there and there's a big depression in the middle. And once the water's going quickly, put the ball in the center, there's our planet, and then spread the pepper on the water and watch what happens. You can see how the particles are swirling around Saturn and some of them are moving faster than others. The ones that are close to the planet are moving faster than the ones around the outside, just like they do when they go around Saturn. You can also look at them from edge on and see how thin they are. They just make a very thin sheet and you can even look underneath the rings, just like we can with Saturn. Of course, there's only one other problem with this model. These pepper grains are far too big for the size of our model Saturn here. They'd have to be much, much smaller and they'd have to be spread out over a much wider area. On this scale, our pepper grains would cover an Olympic swimming pool. Well, that's our show. I do hope that you get a chance to see the rings of Saturn with your own eyes through a telescope. And if not, keep checking that Cassini website for those amazing pictures. In any case, remember, keep your heads up.